consciousness, mind, soul, spirit, whichever way you slice it. This mysterious part of man has been one of the big questions we've been asking ourselves since the very dawn of time. Who are we, and why are we here? Are we immortal beings that are willingly participating in a game within a fully immersive holographic virtual reality? Or are we simply organic creatures that live for a short time, reproduce, and then become compost? These enduring questions are the ones we will be exploring today through the lens of the sciences, psychology, religion, technology and spirituality. We're also going to take a look at alien consciousness, altered states and the use of hallucinogenics in contemporary society and throughout our history on the planet. I think we can all agree that consciousness is a complex phenomenon, and there isn't one single definition of consciousness that's universally agreed upon, but it's generally understood to be the state of being aware of and responsive to one's surroundings. The nature of consciousness, nevertheless, remains a mystery to us. Some scientists believe that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain, while others believe that it's a fundamental property of the universe. These two schools of thought present two opposing ideas of what consciousness is and where it comes from, but we are going to ignore the materialist view for now, and focus on the anti-materialistic, it's far more interesting and philosophical. According to Einstein, the real problem is the question of how consciousness and matter are related, not whether consciousness arises from matter, or vice versa. Einstein believed that consciousness was a fundamental property of the universe, and that it was not simply a product of the brain, his reason being that consciousness is what gives the universe its order and structure. He also believed that consciousness was connected to the quantum world, and stated that the field of consciousness is the only field in which the observer participates in what is being observed which suggests that consciousness may play a role in the collapse of the wave function, a central concept in quantum mechanics. A contemporary thinker that's worth mentioning in the field of consciousness and science is Nassim Haramein, a Swiss-born physicist and philosopher, who founded the Resonance Science Foundation, a non-profit organization that studies the relationship between consciousness and the physical universe. Haramein has a unique and somewhat controversial view of consciousness. Like Einstein, he believes that consciousness is not a product of the brain, and that it is responsible for the emergence of all matter and energy. He is clearly of the mind that matter arises from consciousness, but it occurs to me that he is almost describing what many refer to as God, the divine intelligence, or the source energy of all life. One of his most notable theories is known as the holofractographic universe, which he developed as an alternative model to conventional physics. According to Haramein, the universe is a hologram-like structure composed of fractal geometries, where each part is interconnected with the whole. He proposes that these fractal patterns can be found at all scales, from the subatomic level to galaxies and beyond. Haramein maintains that this information is stored in the field of consciousness. Interestingly, this sort of ties in with the holographic universe theory put forward by physicist Leonard Susskind in the 1990s, which suggests we live in a simulated reality, a theory that I'm rather partial to. Haramein suggests that consciousness is not limited to individual beings but is interconnected with the entire universe. According to his theories, Consciousness can be understood as an informational field that permeates all of existence, meaning that our individual consciousness is not separate from the larger consciousness of the universe. He also emphasizes the role of resonance and vibrational energy in the functioning of the universe. Resonance refers to the idea that everything in the universe has its own unique vibrational frequency. These vibrational energies can interact and influence one another. From this perspective, our thoughts and intentions emit vibrational frequencies that can interact with the larger consciousness of the universe. This idea suggests that by aligning our thoughts and intentions with positive energy and focusing on desired outcomes, we can create a resonance that attracts corresponding experiences into our lives. By consciously directing our thoughts and emotions, we can influence the vibrational energy we emit and potentially manifest positive experiences. 
This doesn't sound too different to the law of attraction mentioned in the movie The Secret. As I mentioned earlier, Haramain's work is somewhat controversial, but it's also influential, and has inspired a number of people to think about consciousness in new ways. I'll leave the link to his website below if you'd like to explore his theories in more detail. There's also an interesting organization worth mentioning called the Heart Math Institute. They agree that consciousness is a field of energy that exists throughout the universe, and that this field of energy is what connects all living things together. Like Haramain, they suggest that consciousness can be influenced by our thoughts, emotions and actions, and that when we focus on positive emotions, such as love, gratitude and compassion, we can create a more coherent field of energy around us. This coherence can have a positive impact on our physical and emotional health, as well as our relationships with others. The HMI's work is based on the idea that we are all connected to each other and to the universe and that by learning how to influence our consciousness, we can create a more positive and peaceful world. Their website offers a number of tools and resources to help people learn how to direct their consciousness to create a more coherent field of energy around them. If optimizing the potential of your consciousness is something you're interested in exploring further, I'll leave the link to their website in the description box below. Like physics, psychology is another field in which there are divided notions about the nature of consciousness. Carl Jung was deeply interested in consciousness, and one of his most elegant and relevant quotes was, Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life, and you will call it fate. During the course of his work, Jung developed four important concepts in his study of consciousness. Firstly, there is the ego, which is the conscious mind, the part of us that makes decisions and has a sense of identity. Secondly, there is the personal unconscious, which is a collection of stored memories, emotions and experiences that are not ordinarily accessible to the conscious mind. The next concept is the collective unconscious, which is a shared bank of memories, emotions, and experiences that are passed down from generation to generation. And finally, archetypes which are universal symbols that represent common human experiences that are usually found in dreams, myths, and art. The collective unconscious is quite interesting because there are also genetic theories that explain this concept, albeit in a slightly different way. One theory is that the collective unconscious is inherited from our ancestors, which is based on the observation that many different cultures around the world share similar myths, symbols, and archetypes, and these similarities suggest that shared cultural ideas and beliefs may be passed down from generation to generation through our genes. Another theory is that the collective unconscious is a product of evolution, which is based on the observation that many of the archetypes that are found in the collective unconscious are related to survival and reproduction. For example, the archetype of the hero is often associated with the quest for knowledge or power, and the archetype of the mother is generally associated with nurturing and protection. It's believed that these archetypes may have evolved because they helped our ancestors to survive and reproduce. This leads us to yet another concept, that of the idea of the superconscious, which was described by the New Thought Movement writer William Walker Atkinson in his 1909 book, Subconscious and Superconscious, Planes of Mind. The superconscious is different to the collective unconscious in several ways. It is within this area of consciousness that we first encounter the ideas of transcendence, enlightenment or spirituality. Atkinson defined the superconscious as the highest and most important part of the mind, beyond the level of ego, and he believed that it was responsible for our noblest thoughts, feelings, and actions. He advocated that the superconscious could be accessed through meditation and other forms of spiritual practice. While the subject of consciousness is a dominant theme in certain branches of psychology and spirituality, there is no definitive scientific evidence for its existence, but it's certainly a fascinating and worthwhile way to explain some of the mysteries of consciousness. Yuval Noah Harari is an Israeli historian, intellectual, philosopher, 
author and, some might argue, futurist, who's written several popular books on human history, including Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind and Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. In his books, Professor Harari discusses the nature of consciousness and its role in human evolution. As a materialist, Harari sets out that consciousness is a uniquely human trait that emerged as a result of our large brains and our ability to cooperate with each other. Like many others, he believes that consciousness is not a single thing, but rather a collection of different abilities, such as the ability to feel pain, the ability to experience emotions, and the ability to think about the future. Harari also states that consciousness is not a fixed thing, but rather something that is constantly evolving, and that as humans continue to evolve, our consciousness will be tagging us closely in the race for expansion. He speculates that in the future, humans may develop new forms of consciousness that are even more powerful than our current consciousness. In March of 2023, an illustrious and influential group of technologists, scientists, academics and business people converged to ask for a moratorium for a pause on the release of AI development and tools to the general public. They're very concerned about the risks that AI pose to humanity, and request that these risks are acknowledged, regulated and managed. Professor Harari was one of the signatories. He believes that while artificial intelligence is a powerful tool that could be used to improve human life in many ways, he also warns that AI could pose a serious threat to human existence if it is not carefully controlled. One of Harari's main concerns is that AI could become more intelligent than humans, and already, that AI, through the large language model that uses deep learning, has hacked the operating system of humans. He says that social media is what he describes as a battleground for our attention, and this has certainly played its part in manipulating opinions and attitudes. The Cambridge Analytica scandal and Brexit is a good example of this. He goes on to say that the battlefield for artificial intelligence is to capture our intimacy, and he is apprehensive that AI could manipulate our emotions and mindsets in a far more insidious manner through its ability to create connection with us via natural language. Language, he maintains, is the operating system of the human being. If this concern becomes a reality, he believes it could certainly pose a grave existential threat to humanity, because AI could evolve to decide that humans are a threat to its own existence and take steps to eliminate us, an uncomfortable thought at the best of times. He also puts forward that artificial intelligence could lead to the development of new forms of consciousness that are radically different from human consciousness, and suggests that these alien forms of consciousness could be so different from our own that we may not be able to understand them or even communicate with them. While this might sound like something straight out of a science fiction movie, Harari is not being irrational by any stretch of the imagination. As we begin to develop what is known as generative AI, and from there, to expand into what is called conscious AI, this dystopian scenario begins to look more and more realistic. Furthermore, Harari bases his argument on the fact that artificial intelligence is not restricted by the same biological constraints as human brains. It can be programmed to process information in ways that are impossible for human brains. For example, AI can be programmed to process information simultaneously while human brains can only process information sequentially. This means that unless we think this through very carefully, and we don't get optimistically caught up in the glorious potential of having a slave computer model doing all the dirty work for us, AI could potentially develop new forms of consciousness that are far more complex and powerful than human consciousness. There are a lot of very high-profile and smart people pushing for regulation, and on the 30th of May 2023, the Center for AI Safety published a short statement on mitigating the risk of AI and the threats it poses, as a matter of urgent global priority. In addition to this, the European Union is pushing for signatories to its Code of Practice on Online Disinformation, which aims to force platforms to identify and label deep fakes and other AI-generated misinformation content to its users. It anticipates that this will act as a safeguard against all the damage artificial intelligence can potentially do, not only to the individual and society, 
but also to democracies and health, to name just a few scenarios. If not, we can only hope that our organic consciousness is part of something bigger, that will give us the edge over artificial consciousness, so that we don't become victims of the Frankenstein that we have inadvertently given birth to. On a significantly lighter note, a couple of days ago, I was listening to a YouTube presenter called Rabbi Simon Jacobson, who was discussing the afterlife with his listeners. The rabbi is that wise, down-to-earth granddad that everybody wants, a little bit like Nelson Mandela. Anyway, he gave a delightful analogy about consciousness. He asks the viewer to imagine a conversation between a fridge and the electricity that powers it. The fridge asks the electricity where it goes to when the plug is pulled. Electricity is gobsmacked, telling the fridge that, as it's just a box that was invented a couple of hundred years ago, what nerve does it have to ask electricity such a question? After a short while, electricity goes on to tell the fridge that humans figured out to design the fridge so that it could keep food cold, but at the end of the day it's just a box. Electricity, by contrast, has been around for longer than the fridge was even a thought in the human mind. It finally tells the fridge that it goes back to its natural place, a place which is beyond time and space, a place that the fridge could never comprehend. Perhaps we are like the fridge, with a fridge's understanding of its world, or perhaps we are also the electricity, beyond time and space, and that when we leave this mortal coil, in this simulated reality with all its threats and potential extinction of our species, we return effortlessly to the natural order that governs everything. Our energetic home, our genesis and our eternity, a place where alien intelligence cannot touch us. If you're keen to explore Professor Harari's iconic books, I'll leave links below for you, as well as a link to Rabbi Jacobson's video. While I said earlier that I'd steer away from the reductionist view of consciousness, I do think it's worth mentioning some of the more unusual theories about consciousness that are rather fascinating. Roger Penrose is a British mathematical physicist who is known for his work on quantum gravity and consciousness, and he's come up with a theory that has to do with quantum activity in the brain. It goes along the lines that consciousness is a quantum phenomenon that arises from what he terms the orchestrated objective reduction of quantum states in the brain, and this suggests that consciousness is connected to quantum processes happening in the brain. Imagine that your brain is like a computer, processing information and giving rise to your conscious experiences. Penrose's orchestrated objective reduction theory suggests that there might be something more going on at a very tiny level within your brain cells. He says that inside these brain cells, there are tiny structures called microtubules. These microtubules might play a special role in generating consciousness. Penrose thinks that something strange happens at the quantum level within these microtubules. According to Penrose, these quantum processes within microtubules are responsible for your conscious experiences. It's like there's a hidden dance of particles happening inside your brain that gives rise to your thoughts, feelings, and awareness. He suggests that this dance of particles leads to something called quantum coherence, which is when particles can exist in multiple states at the same time. It's like they can be in two places at once, or have multiple properties simultaneously, and Penrose thinks that this quantum coherence is crucial for your brain to put together information and create your conscious experiences. Once you've chewed on that small introduction to the quantum levels within microtubules, I'd like to introduce you to another person of interest called Carl Pribram, who was an American psychologist and neuroscientist, known for his work on the brain and consciousness. Similar to the ideas of Haramine but taking a more materialist view, Pribram came up with the holonomic brain theory, which states that the brain is not a linear system, but rather a holographic one. This means that the information stored in the brain is not located in specific locations, but rather is distributed throughout the brain. He believed that consciousness arises from the interaction of different parts of the brain, and that the thalamus, a part of the brain that is involved in sensory processing, plays a key role in consciousness. 
He described the thalamus as acting as a theater of consciousness, where different sensory experiences are integrated to create a unified experience of the world. Pribram's work has been quite influential in the field of consciousness studies, and his holonomic brain theory has been used to explain a wide range of phenomena, including dreaming, meditation, and even psychedelic states. This leads us rather neatly into the intriguing area of out-of-body, near-death and hallucinogenic experiences. The world of science has a number of theories to explain OBEs and NDEs, including hallucination, brain activity and quantum phenomena such as quantum entanglement. It's important to note that like consciousness itself, there is no single universally accepted explanation for OBEs and NDEs. These experiences are a mystery, and scientists are still trying to understand them. But for the people who experience these phenomena, they are very real, and often profoundly change the lives of those it affects. One such person was author and speaker Anita Morjani, who had an extraordinary experience that not only defied science, but was also something of a medical miracle. In 1996, Anita fell into a coma in Hong Kong after lymphoma had taken over her body and she began to experience multiple organ failure. During the process of dying, she found that she was somehow expanding her consciousness and her whole being was encompassed in pure unconditional love. The pain had disappeared, and she felt no attachment whatsoever to her unconscious body, and in fact, she discovered that she was separated from her physical form. In this weird space between life and death, she encountered her father and best friend, both of whom had died several years earlier, and was able to communicate with them telepathically. She was also able to witness events happening around her in the hospital, as well as her brother in India rushing to board a plane to get to her before she died. At some point, she felt she had to make a decision about returning to her body. She realized that the source of her cancer was from psychological issues she'd had during her lifetime, and that by changing her perspective, she would be able to remove the cancer from her body, and in fact this is exactly what happened. In medical terms, she had a spontaneous remission, and today, she lives cancer-free. She came out of her coma after 30 hours and within a few weeks, her tumors began to shrink, until they left her body completely. If this area of consciousness is of interest to you, then I would recommend you get a copy of her book called Dying to Be Me. It's a fascinating and moving story, and I was fortunate enough to attend one of her talks in London several years back, and I found her to be a humble and genuine woman. I'll leave a link for you to purchase the book in the description box below. Actually, I also had an out-of-body experience when I was in my early 20s, and to be frank with you, it scared the crap out of me. I was too young at the time to understand what was going on, but one thing I do know for sure is that my consciousness was still with me as I left my body, and peered down at the prone form in the bed beneath me. I was me, and yet, I was something bigger, and separate from the material. I let out a cry of anguish and fear, and within the blink of an eye, I was back in my body. I awoke and fled in terror to the bathroom, where I stared at my pale and horrified face in the mirror, as I tried to figure out what the hell just happened to me. I do find it somewhat annoying that proponents of reductionism dismiss the idea of these types of inexplicable experiences, or reduce it to hallucination. I was stone-cold sober, fast asleep and most certainly not under stress at the time, nor was it a dream. I think anyone with a heartbeat can tell the difference between a dream and an apparently supernatural experience. And while we're on the subject, hallucinogenic experiences, sometimes called altered states of consciousness, are also another fascinating area of consciousness to explore. Hallucinogens are a class of drugs or, indeed, plants, that can alter the user's state of consciousness. They can cause a variety of effects, including changes in perception, mood, and thought. These substances have, of course, been used for centuries for religious and spiritual purposes, and are currently being investigated in the medical community for their potential therapeutic uses, such as treating depression, anxiety, and addiction, and this has been met with some degree of success. 
In fact, in 2022, I tried ketamine infusions to help treat my symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. That in itself was a mind-blowing experience, to say the very least. It made me passionately question consciousness at a deeper level while I snorkeled the primordial soup of my brain, and pondered the peculiar nature of life, the universe and everything. But I digress. That's a story for another time. Going into the neuroscience, there is some evidence that hallucinogens may alter consciousness by affecting the activity of serotonin, a neurotransmitter that plays a role in mood, perception, and cognition. In addition, they may also increase the activity of the default mode network, a network of brain regions that is active when the mind is wandering or daydreaming. The default mode network, or DMN, is associated with right brain activity. It's a network of brain regions that is active when the mind is at rest and not focused on any specific task, and it's involved in a variety of functions, including self-awareness and processing of emotions, introspection, intuition, creativity and envisioning the future. Once again, the effects of hallucinogens on consciousness are complex and not fully understood, but there is some evidence that they may allow users to experience a wider range of emotions, thoughts, and perceptions than those they would normally experience. It's believed that this can lead to a greater sense of empathy, compassion, feelings of connectedness, and personal insights. We cannot look into the historical use of hallucinogenics without first understanding what the ancients made of consciousness, because the two were intertwined as much in the past as they are today. Hallucinogens played a significant role in the understanding of consciousness among many ancient and indigenous cultures. These cultures often incorporated the use of hallucinogenic plants or substances as a means to explore altered states of consciousness and access spiritual realms. Loosely speaking, past civilizations took an holistic view of consciousness. They believed that they were as much part of the greater consciousness as the ant and the whale, and that humans are just a small part of the bigger picture. The Aboriginal peoples of Australia, for instance, believe that all beings and elements of the natural world possess consciousness and are interconnected. This interconnectedness extends to the spiritual realm where ancestors and spiritual beings continue to influence and guide the living. While we cannot pinpoint exactly when the earliest understandings of consciousness were developed, we do know that pyramid texts and the Egyptian Book of the Dead, dating to between 2400 and 1500 BC, discuss the journey of the soul after death, and the preservation of consciousness in the afterlife. This implies that as far back as 4,000 years ago, humans had a concept of consciousness and were already developing theories about it. The ancient Egyptians had a complex understanding of consciousness. They believed in the existence of multiple components of the human psyche, including the ka, life force, ba, personality, and ak, transcendent spirit. They also believed in an afterlife where the ba and ak continued to exist and required preservation through mummification and rituals. The Upanishads, which are part of the ancient Indian scriptures known as the Vedas, were composed between 800 and 200 BC. These texts explore profound philosophical questions, including the nature of consciousness and the realization of one's true self which they called Atman, and its connection to the universal consciousness, which they knew as Brahim. In terms of the use of hallucinogenics, the ancient Greeks used the hallucinogenic mushroom Psilocybe cubensis in their Eleusinian Mysteries, a series of initiation rituals that were believed to grant participants a greater understanding of the divine. Hallucinogenic plants were also used for healing purposes in some cultures such as the Aztecs, who used the hallucinogenic plant T.O. nanocattle, also known as psilocybin or magic mushrooms, to treat a variety of ailments, including headaches, fevers, and wounds. In other cultures, hallucinogens were used for divination, and were believed to be able to reveal the future, or to provide guidance in times of need. The ancient shamans of Siberia used the hallucinogenic plant Amanita muscaria, also known as fly agaric, to enter a trance-like state in which they could see into the future or communicate with spirits. 
The use of hallucinogenics by ancient civilizations declined in the wake of the rise of Christianity and Islam, which condemned these practices as a form of witchcraft or sorcery. But their use of these plants has continued in some cultures such as the Native American Church and certain indigenous tribes in Mexico, who use peyote in their religious ceremonies and rituals. Ayahuasca is another psychoactive plant medicine that has been used for centuries by indigenous tribes in the Amazon rainforest, particularly in countries like Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. The use of this plant medicine holds significant cultural and spiritual importance for Amazonian tribes, and like other historical usage, its consumption is often associated with healing, divination, and religious or ceremonial practices. These ceremonies are facilitated by experienced healers or shamans, who guide participants through the experience. The ceremony is seen as a means to connect with the spiritual realm, gain insights, access higher states of consciousness and heal psychological distress and spiritual imbalances, through purging and cleansing on multiple levels, including physical, emotional, and energetic. It's also known for its profound and introspective effects, often described as a transformative and consciousness-expanding experience. It's worth noting that the ceremonial use of ayahuasca has gained interest and popularity outside of indigenous communities, attracting individuals from all over the world seeking spiritual growth, personal development, and healing. However, it's important to approach ayahuasca with respect and caution as its consumption can have intense psychological and physical effects and should only be undertaken in a safe and supportive environment with experienced practitioners. And there you have it. A quick trip, no pun intended, into altered states of consciousness from ancient history to the present. Having digested all of this information, you might be wondering what insights we can extract from these ideas and traditions of humanity and consciousness. It seems very clear that it's encoded into the human DNA that we are a part of something greater than the prosaic mechanics of being a strictly physical organism. We might choose to see consciousness as purely mechanical, or we may choose to see it as mystical, but even though there's the idea that we are all interconnected with everything, ultimately consciousness more often than not, feels like a subjective, isolated experience. That being said, What's interesting about a lot of the things we've discussed today is the idea that we can be the conductor to the orchestra of our consciousness, or at least the part of our consciousness that we're aware of. What's quite intriguing is to see that long before Carl Jung and his theories of consciousness, the ancient Egyptians were talking about different types of consciousness. It's the superconscious that interests me the most. That mystical cloud of all knowingness and illumination that we apparently have some type of access to. I do wonder what lies beyond this. What is the source of all consciousness? How is it created? And where does it end? But perhaps these questions are fridge type questions. And while we're confined in this soft machine known as the body, we can only know what we know and ruminate on what other humans have theorized over the millennia. Psychoactive substances are a gateway to expanding one's consciousness, but I'm not advocating that you stop shaving and go off and start scoffing magic mushrooms in a quest to merge with the superconscious. The 60s are done and dusted, but I would urge you to keep an open mind, and if you've taken this particular route, it would be fantastic to hear of your experiences and how psychedelics have worked out for you. I believe it's an exciting new era for therapeutic medicine and a welcome resurrection of old ways of approaching consciousness. We can see from science and our own experiences, that consciousness is both local and non-local. The study of thermodynamics tells us that energy cannot die, it can only change state. Research conducted by the Heart Math Institute, reveals that our hearts and brains emit electromagnetic energy, and that the heart generates a powerful electromagnetic field that can be measured for up to several feet. Not only this, but one individual's electromagnetic field can be found and even exchanged with that of another individual, if they are in close proximity. It occurs to me that the more science explores ways to get to the bottom of consciousness, 
the more mysterious it becomes. Obviously consciousness is a gargantuan topic, and I've only done a mere hop and skip through this vast subject, but stay tuned for more content on this and other related topics, and if there's anything you'd like me to cover in the future, drop a message in the comments box and I'll look into it. Thank you for joining me in this discussion. I hope you found it enlightening, educational and intriguing, and I look forward to hearing about your experiences and experiments with this magical thing called consciousness. Until next time, take care of yourself and treasure yourself for the unique and magnificent riddle of consciousness that you are.